But the problem is that the large part of the public discourse about uh, development becomes a discourse about aid. And that discourse about aid becomes not how to make it work, but at whether it works, which is a question which is not very well defined. Because at the end of the day, aid is just money. The money is spent on things, on policies, on actions. And what, matter is, what matters is every single of these actions, what are they doing? A big part of my, my work is actually trying to shift the conversation at that level. I shift the conversation from whether aid is good with a big A or it's bad, whether it should be aid or it should be trade, and to think about policies and programs instead. One of the reasons is, is that, that the debate is just too vague. The other reason is that aid is a, such a small part of the whole equation. I regret to tell you, since you're all in the business of giving money away, when you put all the money combined, even with the remarkable efforts that's been done, this is a pretty small amount of the money that is being spent on the poor in the world. You take a large country like India, which has a number of poor people, gets almost no aid. And even in Africa, where aid is a more important part of the world, this is only 5.7% uh, of the budget of African countries that, is, that comes from aid. You, you might think it's a lot, but it's still, it means there are 95 other person that we also need to worry about. And another objective of my work is to try to th think in this way. We are not about the 5%, we are about the 100%. So I want to think about your efforts. I want to think about the efforts of both private donors and governments from the West with their own money as not being an, an end in itself, but as, think of it, the venture capitalism funding of finding the good ideas in development. Because in that case, Think of each dollar you're spending as being multiplied many, many fold, leveraged many, many fold. If it helps us identify what really works, that can then be taken up as a policy in a very large scale. So that's the reason for my work, and that's the reason for putting so much emphasis on the evaluation of specific programs. Another reason is that uh, Focusing on like just large issues, which is what most of the public discourse on development and aid is about, stifles people's uh, energy. I thought I would identify three things that we uh, point out in the book, which is three are uh, maybe surprising facts, three things that I didn't know and maybe you didn't know either, and that would have been difficult to know without employing the kind of methods uh, that uh, we work with, in particular randomized control trials. So the first one is that uh, sometimes you can save money by paying people. Yeah. In 30 villages, uh, Sevamandir set up monthly immunization camps. And in 30 villages, they set up camps plus uh, this small incentive, a kilo of lentils for each immunization. So you can say, great, we, we, we reach 38%, but can we really afford the lentil? Can we afford to add the lentil? And this is where the little factory that I started from is important. It actually saves money to give the lentils. The cost per a kid fully immunized is $50 in a camp uh, without incentive and 27 in a camp with incentive. And the reason is, once you, once you set a camp, you have to man the camp. The person, the nurse, has to be there for three, three hours or five hours, and you're paying their salary. So the more kids she can immunize, the more your cost goes down per immunization. And that cost is much larger than the cost of the lentils, which is negligible. There is another example coming from education, which, is, which says tracking is good for everyone. What's tracking? To put it in the less a least politically correct terms, it's uh, ability grouping. Education is a story of success in the, last, uh, in the last few decades. The number of kids who are going to school in the world has increased steadily at the primary level, at the secondary level, etc. This is great. At some level, it's a bit of a disaster. Uh, this is India. And in India, most kids of primary school age are in school, but 40% of the kids enrolled in grade 2 to 5 can read a paragraph. This was 2005. And 30% um, of them could do a simple division. 
In 2006, the numbers were the same. In 2007, the number was the same. 2008, 2009, 2010, the number have not moved. The truth is that benefits of education are, are accrued at every single year, but parents are misled about that. And the result is that the entire system conspires, teachers, uh, curriculum, districts, parents, etc., to this very elite bias system where the majority of the kids is completely lost immediately. So we are learning here not only that there is this intervention that we can do, but the general principle about how, we, how can we think about school systems to try and address this problem and think about teaching the kids who are actually in class as opposed to some like dreamed up elite that may or may not make it to secondary school. Here's the last uh, example that I want to give you today, which is uh, the poor suffer from risk, but they actually don't want to buy insurance. So the poor suffer from risk because a lot of them are uh, running their own business. 50% of the urban poor run the small business. Of course, the large ma majority of the rural poor have a farm. And therefore, they are subject to the vagary of the weather. They are subject to the prices, input prices, output prices. If they have an accident or if they become sick, everything goes haywire, etc. So risk is an absolutely fundamental part of the life of the poor. And of course, risk means that when a shock hits, you can find yourself in an absolutely terrible position. But it also means, because it is so costly and because it is uninsured, that it actually hurts you even before the shock hits. And the reason is that if you think that, um, say, the input prices, the weather, the output prices are fluctuating all the time, you might want to prefer to stick to what you know very well stick to the technology that has been used for a long time and willy-nilly uh, ensures subsistence for your family in not such a risky way. So you have farmers like these ones who will stick to traditional variety of maize instead of hybrid who will not use fertilizer and thereby have agricultural productivity which is much, much lower than what they could have because they are worried about, uh, about risk. So given that, uh, there is this, you know, uh, great view in the world where we are all operating together that insurance is the way to go and insurance may in fact be the next uh, billion dollar market and we should go l just all go and try and sell insurance to these guys. The one little wrinkle in that uh, plan is that when insurance is offered to people, there is no particular sign that they want it. Uh, here is a Exa an example from an experiment that Dean Carlin and Chris Udry run in Ghana. Uh, they offer to farmer uh, what is called as parametric weather insurance, which is an insurance policy that pays you if the, w if the uh, amount of rainfall in the nearby weather station falls below some threshold. So if you offer the insurance for free, everybody wants it. That's kind of encouraging. Uh, uh, if you start charging for it, though, the demand for it falls down quickly. At uh, four CDs per acre, only 40% of people want any. At 9.5, which is the price that covers the risk, uh, about 40% uh, again. And at about 14, which is what the company would need to charge to make any money, uh, the demand is basically zero. So it is not clear at all that insurance is the next billion dollar market opportunity because if people are not willing to pay for it, then you can't make money with it. That doesn't mean you shouldn't offer it, but it means it might be difficult to offer it for money. So what is behind this? Why are people not wanting to take this product, which is even at some level evidently a good product? And I think the reason is that uh, because of the difficulty of offering insurance, you have the risk of fraud, you have the risk of moral hazard, you have the risk of adverse selection. In offering insurance is actually not that easy. So in developing countries, when you don't have good accounting system, you don't have good monitoring system, every, the only thing that the insurance company are willing to offer are very simple products, such as this one, which doesn't require any checking in the farm. It's not dependent on anything the farmers did. It's just dependent on whether it rained or not. So the it, administration is much, much easier. It doesn't cost you much money. You don't have to. So from the point of view of the farmer, what, you are, what we are offering when we are offering a parametric weather insurance is a kind of a lottery. It's a lottery which pays you maybe when things are bad and, and sometimes don't. 
and that you don't necessarily fully understand either. But even if you did understand, this is something which, given our psychology, we think it was kind of silly to buy a lottery that uh, may or may not pay you in bad states. You don't even want to think about it. So that suggests that if we want to be serious about insurance, we will have to be serious about thinking how much does it need to be subsidized. And then the question of impacts comes up, which is if, if the insurance has to be subsidized, that might still be a great idea. In fact, I'm very convinced that this is a great idea to subsidize insurance. But then we have to see what are the impacts of, 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 of having insurance on people's welfare and people's behavior. So this experiment is set up to do that because some people got it for free. So you can see, for example, that people who got the insurance are much more likely to have gone days without eating. They are more likely to use fertilizer on their field. They are more likely to have healthier children, etc. So the impact being demonstrated can give us some idea that things to be should be uh, subsidized. So why does all of this matter? I think all of this matters because you hear a lot of discourses about uh, the problems of the poor countries being too difficult, either because there are just too many of them, as in the Rokia Zambia experiment, or in uh, what we call the sort of the political economy view of the world, which is developing countries are just too corrupt, there is nothing you can do, and you must have heard a lot of this uh, thing in your work. You know, what you're doing is kind of the small things. In the big scale of things, we can't really do anything. And we think that there might be some truth to the fact that there are political constraints, we all, uh, all know that. We are thinking that there are actually many, many dollar bills lying on the ground. There are many ways in which policies could be substantially improved. Uh, we call uh, the uh, scourge of development policy uh, the three I, which are uh, ideology, ignorance, and inertia. Uh, Programs are often born in ideology, so the poor are either entrepreneurs, or they are starving, or they are slothful, or they are whatever it is, you, you name your favorite one. They are conceived in ignorance of the reality of the field, and then they persist because once they exist, there is a consistency for them to continue, and they just continue. And I think we need to fight against that. That means that there is things that can be fixed. There is the reason for things not really working all that well very much in the real world. is not some kind of fatality that we can all hide behind uh, peacefully. It's some misconception. And if it's some misconception, we can try and clear this misconception. That's where I think you all play a role, which is by having the courage, taking the risk of evaluating what you do and what you find then you can play a part in this effort. You can play a part in this effort that is going to improve the way your work works, but also the way this type of...